Thank you. Hi everyone. Um, yeah, today I'll uh, I'll be talking a bit about different projects we are running in the lab where we use uh, supervised reinforcement learning to look at biodiversity, specifically aiming to estimate biodiversity uh, in the present, through time, through deep time, and also trying to uh, learn from from these biodiversity patterns and uh, and from the extinction risks that biodiversity is currently uh, facing and try to use AI again to uh, guide conservation action. So um, just to recap, I'm sure you've seen this stuff before, but basically uh, the first thing that I would like to talk to you about is uh, models uh, based on supervised learning. And so these are typically uh, uh, in our applications, deep neural networks that can be used for classification or uh, regression types of tasks. So these are basically models that take a bunch of inputs and map them into an output. And one way to use these type of models in uh, biodiversity, of course, there are many uh, applications of these models. But like one of the ways we have been using these type of supervised learning models is to infer biodiversity um, in a spatial context. And so here we are uh, looking at uh, present day biodiversity and specifically we we'll, uh, we'll look at some uh, plots where all species were recorded by scientists and these are uh, available in a database as plot. And you can see here these, these red dots map the uh, distribution of these plots where we know every single species of plant that lives uh, in there. Uh, you can see from the distribution of these plots that uh, the plots are uh, a lot, but they're also biased in the geographic distribution and they don't span the entire Australian continent. Um, meanwhile, we have a lot of data sets uh, that do span the Australian uh, the continents and uh, the global, uh, and they have a global distribution. For example, the GB uh, occurrence data. Um, spans the entire world and records uh, species information from uh, hundreds of thousands of species with billions of records out there. Uh, we also have climatic data that spans and covers the whole uh, world. So we have lots of databases that probably have some predictive value in understanding biodiversity patterns um, and they span uh, the world. On the other hand, accurate uh, uh, human collected biodiversity data is much more sparse to come by. So here we can use uh, supervised deep learning to try and map these predictive variables onto predictions of biodiversity. And then if we can do a good job at predicting biodiversity for the plots where we do know the ground truth, which is how many species occur there, we can then uh, use this model to extrapolate and create maps of biodiversity. And so this is a uh, uh, a project that we did um, uh, a couple of years ago uh, in my group. And so we use these predictive variables, we map them to uh, quantification of biodiversity per plot. And then we train our model, uh, evaluated our accuracy across different sizes of plots. And then we are able to extrapolate. So once we are happy with the accuracy of our model, we can use these models to extrapolate and create maps of biodiversity. Here we look two metrics of biodiversity, the uh, gamma biodiversity, gamma diversity and um, beta diversity. Gamma diversity is basically how many species are out there. Uh, beta diversity is a quantification of turnover, how different are two adjacent plots in terms of species composition. So they measure different um, metrics of biodiversity. So these are the maps that we obtain uh, with our deep learning framework. So here the inputs were basically um, occurrence records from GB, climate data, uh, and a few other layers. Um, and then uh, our trained models were used to generate uh, proje projections of gamma diversity across the continent and beta diversity. Uh, so turnover basically across the continent. Now in machine learning, there is a lot of focus on accuracy, right? Uh, we want our models to be as accurate as possible. Uh, which is great for many things, but uh, in ecology and in evolutionary biology, sometimes we are more interested almost or as interested 
in accuracy as we are in um, the uncertainty in our predictions. So we don't only want to have a model that is doing a, a good job at making predictions, but we also have a model that we also would like to have a model that tells us where the predictions are less reliable. And here we can use uh, techniques, for example, uh, Monte Carlo dropout, that is uh, basically an extra layer that you add to your network to evaluate uh, how uh, robust our estimates are. And this is what we did here, and we identified areas where uh, the prediction is affected by high uncertainty. So now we have maps with predictions for the entire continent, but we can also identify areas where our predictions are probably not as reliable. This type of uh, quantification of uncertainty is, um, is really important uh, because it can also guide uh, research efforts. So if we wanted our model to be more accurate in predicting, in predicting gamma diversity, we'll probably want to add plots here. If we wanted our model to be uh, more accurate and reliable for better diversity predictions, then we'll need more um, training data in this shaded area here. So we can use deep learning models to make predictions of uh, biodiversity patterns today. When we talk about biodiversity today, the good thing is that we do have a way to get a ground truth. Like we just need to go out there and count all the species. This of course is not as easy as just counting things, but uh, there exists at least in general, a way to get a ground truth. So we can train our models uh, with plots where we are pretty confident that we know the ground truth. Things get more complicated if you are interested in understanding how biodiversity evolved over deep time. So this is another of uh, the research uh, uh, objectives of our group. And it's basically trying to understand not only how, not only how biodiversity is distributed today, but how did we get there? What's the evolutionary process that led to uh, the biodiversity we observe today. And estimating biodiversity through time, in deep time, so millions of years, um, is uh, really crucial to understanding some very fundamental uh, problems in evolutionary biology and in, understanding our, uh, in our understanding of the history of life. For example, is there a limit to biodiversity or can just species accumulate forever? Uh, does biodiversity increase over time? Or what are the mechanisms controlling biodiversity? These are questions that have been around for a long time and they can uh, be answered by um, obtaining reliable estimates of how biodiversity changed through time in the first place. So people have been looking at the fossil record to understand and try to uh, plot how diversity accumulated over time. And this is basically how we know about the past mass extinctions that occurred during the history of life on Earth. So the fossil record is the closest that we have uh, to a ground truth because um, it is the most direct evidence of past biodiversity. But at the same time, the fossil record is played by all sorts of biases. So it is by no means a ground truth. We can count species in the fossil record, but we will have to be aware of the fact that uh, the fossil record is biased taxonomically, spatially, and temporally. So there are all sorts of things that make our uh, fossil record incomplete. Therefore, we can just use uh, standard supervised learning to uh, estimate biodiversity through time because we cannot easily train a model on ground truth data. And people have been trying to interpret the fossil record, uh, so not going beyond just counting species, using other types of statistical models for a long time. Unfortunately, a couple of uh, high-profile papers, or maybe fortunately, I should say, a couple of high-profile papers uh, have shown that uh, just applying simple statistics to extrapolate through species diversity from the fossil record is not actually accounting for all the biases that affect the fossil record. And because of uh, this uh, intrinsic incompleteness of the fossil record, essentially the available models out there are uh, unable to estimate robustly uh, biodiversity through time. So we decided to take a different approach and to use um, uh, deep learning methods instead. Now, the question is, again, as I said, that we don't have ground truth, right? We don't have a ground truth data. Um, 
when we look at deep time evolutionary models, we basically never have access to ground truth. Even when we model how the DNA evolves over time, we can ground truth it for a very short amount of times or for very fast evolving organisms like bacteria. But we don't really have a way to validate experimentally how the DNA evolved across mammals or across animals. Right, because the time scales are billions of years or millions of years, so we can experimentally validate our models. So when we build models, uh, typically in a probabilistic framework, what we are going to do is to apply likelihood-based types of analysis. So this is if we don't use AI, we will typically develop mechanistic probabilistic models of evolution. For example, models of how DNA uh, change over time. Uh, this will define the mechanisms of evolution. We can build then an unsupervised model, and using likelihoods, we can estimate our parameters of interest, for example, the genetic distance between taxa. So this is how we would typically deal with a context where we don't have ground truth data. What we can also do then, and what we typically do when we develop new models, is to generate data under the assumptions of these evolutionary mechanisms, so we can simulate data sets here, run these data sets where we do know a ground truth and we have realistic data sets, run these data through our unsupervised models and verify whether we are able to recover the truth uh, the, as we simulated it. Now, what we're doing now for uh, using deep learning is taking a similar approach. And once we have our model, of course, we can run it with empirical data. With supervised learning, what we can do is to create a model, a generative model that reflects our understanding of evolutionary processes, use this model to generate training data, and then train a supervised learning model so that it, uh, that it is able to parse our data and make a prediction for the parameters of interest. Once we have a trained model, then we can run it through empirical data and then obtain our parameters. So basically using a probabilistic framework or a supervised deep learning framework um, to estimate these type of parameters is just taking a slightly different route to getting in the end to the parameters of interest. And this is what we did for uh, biodiversity through time. So in our attempts to estimate biodiversity through time is we cannot just train a model based on ground truth data we had to basically create a simulator of ground truth. And so uh, one of the projects we are developing in our lab is uh, um, developing a soft, is implementing a software called Deep Dive for uh, deep learning estimation of diversity trajectories. And here, part of the software is a simulator of biodiversity. So we simulate biodiversity using spatial explicit birth death processes. So using stochastic models that are typically used to describe the process of speciation and distinction. And then we have simulations of the fossil records. So once we have a ground truth of diversity through time and space, we can generate the fossil record that is sampled from this true diversity. And here we can introduce all the biases that we know occur in the fossil record. So spatial biases, temporal biases, taxonomic biases. Once we do that, then we are going to have a ground truth that is like the true diversity through time and the sample diversity, which is what is left basically in this incomplete and biased fossil record. So we can generate these data sets and use them to train a deep learning model. If we generate enough, uh, enough data sets that cover a very wide range of uh, settings, then we can hope that our model is trained in a way that once it's fed with empirical data, we return a realistic estimation of biodiversity through time. Here we use um, recurrent neural networks, which are basically neural nets where uh, the output of each, um, the outputs of different nodes are basically interconnected. And this is a way to uh, account for the temporal autocorrelation between uh, time beams. And so we are going to have inputs for each time beam here, which describe basically the fossil record in that time beam, and then obtain an output that is a time series of biodiversity through time. So we can train this model based on hundreds of thousands of simulations because we generate the data, we can generate them, we can generate 
as many as we want. We, we are not stuck with some limited uh, sets of ground truth. Uh, so we generate lots of data sets, we train our models, and then we can validate our model. Here we compare our model to the state-of-the-art uh, non-AI model to estimate diversity, and we found that under a different under different settings, under different preservation scenarios, uh, our model is consistently outperforming uh, the alternatives. So once we are happy with our models and we see that our models perform well in the presence of temporal, taxonomic, and spatial biases, then we can apply them to real data. Um, and this is what we did with the data set of uh, the elephant clade. So elephants are a clade that uh, is very charismatic and today is represented by only three species. We know from the fossil record that there used to be many more elephant species uh, roaming Earth until quite recently. So this is sample diversity through time. These are millions of years. Uh, today's diversity is down here. So we already know from the fossil record that there used to be many more species of elephants than there are today. But by feeding this type of data into our deep learning framework, we get an estimate of true, true biodiversity through time. We get again envelopes of in that describe our uncertainty around uh, these estimates. But what we do observe is that, of course, the fossil record is an underestimation, provides an underestimation of the true diversity for the clade. So the, by the, the species richness of elephants in the past, in the recent past, was way higher than it is today. And indeed, we reconstruct a tenfold drop in diversity in elephants uh, in less than one million years. This is basically, uh, for this clay, the mass extinction that occurred very recently in time. Using other types of analysis, we can identify the causes of this drop, uh, which um, in our uh, findings is uh, basically attributable to humans for the most part. So humans killed most of these uh, uh, elephant biodiversity. So what we can see here is that uh, even clades that have a very long and successful history of biodiversity uh, are exposed to the risks uh, uh, driven by anthropogenic pressure on the environments. For the elephants, uh, the mass extinction has already happened. For many other groups, uh, that's not the case. Uh, and certainly we have thousands and thousands of species out there that are at risk today. Uh, under some estimates, uh, there may be up to 1 million species that are endangered with extinction today. So. We can use our models to, to understand the evolution of biodiversity, but we can also use AI to try and do something about uh, the present risks that biodiversity is facing. Um, sticking to uh, supervised learning, we can use supervised learning to improve our understanding of which and how many species are extinct in the first place. Um, some of you may be familiar with the IUCN Red List. This is the basically the gold standard for uh, assessing whether species are at risk or not. It works with a, a, a set of labels that identify species from least concern up to critically endangered. Critically endangered species are species that are expected to, to go extinct uh, within the next 10 years with 50% chance. So really endangered. Um, this uh, evaluation of species is usually done by experts that take uh, a look at various uh, sources of information, including dynamics of population size for each species, range size, uh, where these species occur, whether they are threatened by poaching or other things. Um, and after an evaluation, one species at a time, the ICN Red List assessors will label these species. This is an extremely important uh, task because it can guide conservation efforts. Um, but it's also an extremely time consuming task because it requires experts for every single group of species out there. So if you're interested in birds or mammals, that's all good because all birds and all mammals have been assessed by the ICN Red List. Um, and you can use then these predictions to uh, these uh, estimations of threats to make, for example, predictions for the future. So here is a study where we looked at uh, current trends in extinction risk in birds, and if you know things stay as they are today, so if we don't improve the current status of, of species, we may be losing uh, 
uh, more than 100 species of trees in the next 100 years. So these are the type of things that we can do once we have these labels. The problem is if you care about other things that are maybe less charismatic than birds, but equally beautiful, if you ask me, then the problem is that these uh, species are not assessed to the same extent. Plants, uh, if, you, if you're interested in plants, there is only 7% of plants that have been already assessed by the IUCN. This is partly due to the fact that there are many plants out there. So there may be 350,000 uh, uh, flowering plants out there, flowering plant species out there. If you're interested in invertebrates, the, the case is even worse with only 2% of them assessed. Fungi is like, basically, uh, we don't know almost anything about their conservation status so far. Meanwhile, we have a lot of other data that spans um, many more species in the IUCN red list. I mentioned before the GB database. This uh, collects occurrence records for uh, millions of species. Um, we also have other things that can be uh, layered together with occurrence data. For example, human footprint estimates or uh, estimates of land use or human pressure on the environment. And so um, we recently developed an R package that basically collects this data across species and uses the available labels from the ICN Red List to train a predictive model and try to fill the gaps in these groups. Um, so the model works uh, using uh, a deep neural network where the input is multiple sources of information, for example, species of current data from GB, human footprint data, environmental data. But the model can also incorporate phylogenetic information, traits, if we think they may be relevant uh, to predicting the conservation status of species. Uh, and then the model basically maps Maps these inputs into a prediction of whether a species is threatened or not. And we recently applied this, uh, this framework to a database of uh, three species. So there are uh, about 58,000 species of trees out there. And uh, using this automated framework, we were able to complement uh, the ICN red list by doubling the number of species that have an assessment uh, reaching 49,000 species of trees. So um, using a, a fairly simple pipeline, we were able to collect occurrence data for, for 49,000 species of trees, train a model based on the trees that had been assessed by the IUCN at least, and then make predictions for the others. Um, we can then use these predictions to map where the uh, highest fraction of extinct uh, or uh, species at risk of extinction uh, is found. For example, we found uh, unsurprisingly that Madagascar has the highest uh, fraction of threatened uh, tree diversity. Uh, and that's partly because it's got an extremely high diversity and extremely uh, endemic diversity. Um, overall, we found that um, about 40% of tree species worldwide may be threatened with extinction. We can also map them by biome, so looking where, in which type of ecosystems they live. And we found that threatened species are kind of found pretty much everywhere. So there is a, they aren't just accumulating to tropical habitats, but they're found everywhere. As I mentioned earlier, with this type of models, we are not only interested in making our predictions as accurate as possible, but we are also interested in knowing in which cases our model doesn't actually know. So under which uh, circumstances is our model unreliable? And we, could we can do this, for example, by mapping uh, prediction accuracy spatially. And by doing this, so we can do this using our uh, uh, training validation data. And we found that uh, the uh, Southeast Asia is the place where the, our prediction accuracy is expected to be the lowest. And knowing this uh, is important because it can uh, 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 we can use this to be a bit careful in interpreting whatever we estimate uh, for this region, but it can also direct um, the efforts to classify manually um, the conservation status of all these species. So we can use this information to uh, 
um, refocus our efforts uh, to complete this database. The um, other types of models that I would like uh, to talk a bit about today is uh, reinforcement learning. Uh, they're based on reinforcement learning. So, so far we've seen different instances of supervised learning where we either had a ground truth, like in this case, or in the case uh, of modern biodiversity, or we made up our ground truth using generative models and simulations as we did to infer biodiversity in deep time. Um, but another type of uh, deep learning models or AI models uh, is actually reinforcement learning, which you may have come across. Uh, and it's the uh, type of AI that is used, for example, for uh, uh, dynamic tasks like driving a car or driving a drone. So. Reinforcement learning is basically a type of AI that deals with an environment that uh, is dynamic in itself and uh, basically learns how to interpret the environment and make uh, a decision, take an action. The context within which we use reinforcement learning in, uh, in our work is uh, for conservation purposes. Um, here we have an environment that is dynamic, that is Earth, basically. So the uh, a system where we have multiple species, these species may be threatened or not, they have a geographic range. So this is like a spatially explicit framework. Um, these species have phylogenetic uh, relationships, they connect them. Uh, and in this environment, we don't only have the biodiversity aspect, there is this multitude of species and their geographic ranges, but we also have uh, other factors that are affecting the um, conservation status of these species. So we have land use uh, that may dynamically change over time and may display species or reduce the geographic range of species. Uh, we have costs which reflect basically um, the um, cost of protecting particular areas. And these again can be dynamic, they can, may change over time as a function of land use, for instance. And uh, within an environment where we want to make political decisions about what to conserve or what to uh, focus our conservation efforts on, we we'll also have a budget that we need to rely on. So ideally we would be able to protect every species and every single corner of earth. In practice, this is not possible. And it's limited by uh, the needs that we have to uh, um, to generate resources from our from uh, land, but also on, uh, we need to uh, rely on budgets that can limit how much we can actually protect and implement conservation policies. So this is going to be the environment, and. Uh, in the same framework, we'll have conservation targets, which is basically what do we want our conservation policy to uh, reach. A conservation target will, for example, define uh, it which in which case is our conservation policy successful. For example, if our target is to protect uh, as many species as possible and prevent every species from going extinct, then uh, the uh, reward that we get if the uh, conservation policy is implemented correctly will be a positive reward every time a species doesn't go extinct and a negative reward every time a species does go extinct. So we can define this reward system to tell the reinforcement learning algorithm when it's doing a good thing versus when it's doing a bad thing. And the concept behind reinforcement learning is that you will have an agent that is basically the policy maker that reads in this environment and based on what it sees in the environment, will make a decision. The decision here will be to protect something or to protect a particular area. When this protection is applied, then the agent will collect a reward. It's basically a score in a video game. Did this protection action uh, lead to a positive outcome or a negative outcome? This will be the reward. Based on the rewards, the agent will optimize its way to make decisions. So at the beginning, we'll just read in this environment, translate this environment, uh, all of this information in the environment 
basically into an action. We are going to use a deep learning, a deep neural network to do that. This action will be selecting, for example, an area for protection. So this area is from now on protected. The action will have a repercussion on the environment. Okay, so the environment will be updated based on this action. This will mean we'll change the land use in this area. Uh, it will affect our budget because we'll have spent some of our budget to, uh, to uh, apply this, implement this action. And it will have a potential repercussions for the species that occur in this area. From this updated environment, then the agent will uh, get an, a reward. And this will be a positive reward if it is good or a negative reward if it is bad. Based on the updated environment and the reward, there will be some optimization of the parameters and the next action will be taken, which is the next area to protect. This area will be here and now it will have repercussions on the environment. The agent will basically play this game of protecting areas over and over again. And when it ends the budget, it will start again fresh with a new budget and try again. And every time we collect these uh, rewards and it will try to learn from the rewards. Learning from the rewards will mean uh, learning how to translate whatever is fed uh, uh, as, a, as an environment to the uh, network here and translate this into the right action. So the agent will play this game many, many times and then it optimizes the parameters and it learns how to best map any input data into a decision, into an action. We can use this with empirical data, for example, using biodiversity data here uh, across many species of plants. Here there is three shown, but we actually apply this to 1,500 species. We can, we can basically combine this biodiversity data with socioeconomic uh, and environmental data to describe, for example, the disturbance uh, to the environment, the cost of each uh, cell in this map. We can feed this thing through our train uh, policy and obtain a map of conservation priorities. We can use this framework to evaluate uh, the outcome of our policy and the outcome of different types of policies. For example, uh, do we need to know everything from this environment to make the best decisions? Or can we get a proxy for this? Do we need to know where every species is exactly? Or can we just use an approximation of this and still get a good outcome? We can validate this uh, through simulations um, where we, uh, we can simulate an environment where we know everything, where we potentially have access to every single individual of every single species in an environment. And then we only give partial information to the agent to see how well it does. So here we mapped along different axes, biodiversity, protected area, genetic diversity, and species value. We mapped the outcome of, an, of a policy uh, trained through reinforcement learning. And if we let the agent only observe the environment once and then apply all of its uh, budget, spend all of its budget to conserve everything, uh, we will get uh, a certain outcome here represented by this polygon. But if we let the agent observe at every time step uh, the outcome of the previous uh, action, then we will get a much better outcome. So this means that if you monitor biodiversity as you apply your conservation policy, you will get much better outcomes than if you just do monitoring once and then apply the entire conservation policy that is supposed to work for the next 30 years. Even if the information is not perfect, here simulated as citizen science type of information where we don't necessarily know, we don't let the agent know exactly where every species lives, we still get, we already get a much, uh, a strong improvement in the outcome of this policy. And if we let the agent know every single detail about biodiversity, we get some improvement, but it's not as crucial as uh, doing this monitoring of biodiversity very regularly through the implementation of the policy. We can use reinforcement learning to optimize policies that target different um, objectives. So this was a policy that focused on protecting as much biodiversity as possible, but we can also train a policy 
to maximize uh, the value of species of the protected species, for example, the commercial value of the protected species. And this will come, uh, will result in a different outcome. So we can use this framework also to evaluate the trade-offs between different objectives, conservation objectives. So if we focus on species value or if we focus on area, we are going to, uh, to have trade-offs on how much biodiversity we protect. And to close, we, we just uh, uh, started applying this framework to uh, evaluate the 30 by 30 uh, conservation uh, pledge, which you might have heard of. Uh, last year, there was this uh, landmark agreement on biodiversity that was signed by over 200 countries worldwide that basically aims to protect 30% of Earth by 2030. Um, so this is uh, an enormous task that we all hope will be successful. But the question is then, okay, which 30% should we protect? And what will be the uh, potential outcomes of choosing these 30% under different uh, objectives? So we can use our reinforcement learning framework to, uh, to make predictions for uh, potential outcomes of different in implementations of the 30 by 30 policy. And to do that, we simulated data sets. Again, working with simulated data sets is useful because uh, we can compare different uh, applications of the uh, policy and we can have replicates of our, of our policies. So here we generated uh, 100 data sets of uh, biodiversity data sets with different uh, number of species, different species ranges, uh, different costs of conservation and different uh, simulated habitat degradation patterns. So we generated da these data sets and then we implemented the 30 by 30 policy under different settings. One was focusing on minimizing the cost of the 30 by 30 implementation. One was focusing on a naive uh, uh, metric that is just trying to protect the uh, areas with the highest biodiversity. Um, one was focusing on uh, the mean species abundance, which is a, a metric of intactness of the environment. And the last one was based on uh, our uh, reinforcement learning optimization. Um, so we can run these different policies within our framework and then uh, evaluate the outcome of these policies, of these implementations, right? So we can evaluate how much each of these policies cost at the end, how much intactness we achieve with this protection, how much did we reduce uh, the threat overall using this STAR metric that is commonly used for uh, evaluating risks, biodiversity risks. And then we can check how many of the simulated endangered species were actually protected within our framework. So we did this through simulations, and now I'm going to compare to show you the outcome of these four different policies uh, as a relative change to the minimum cost implementation. So these are percentage differences between these different policies and the minimum cost policy. What we observe is that any policy that is focused on biodiversity will cost a lot more than just a policy that is focusing on minimizing the cost. So this is not unsurprising, but it's something quite important because uh, some governments at least will probably prefer this type of uh, implementation of the 30 by 30. So it's important to show that if we are interested in biodiversity, we are going to have to spend more than the bare minimum to do a good job. On the other hand, we see that any policy that is not focused on costs, but focused on biodiversity will improve the outcome. So in terms of biodiversity. So it will improve the intactness of the environment significantly compared to a minimum cost policy. It will reduce the threat and it will protect more species. So even if we don't use AI, we whatever policy we, we use to uh, prioritize the 30% uh, that will be protected by 2030, um, focusing on biodiversity will have a much better outcome than focusing on costs alone. What we also observe from these experiments is that uh, using AI actually improves the outcome of uh, 
of a 30 by 30 implementation. So we significantly reduce the threat uh, and we protect significantly more threatened species by using our AI framework compared to using other more naive policies. So this is basically a justification for using a more complex model uh, rather than a simple metric when uh, guiding our and prioritizing our uh, conservation efforts. Um, so we have a preprint out there where we look at many more statistics than the one that I showed, which uh, will hopefully uh, convince uh, you and hopefully the policymakers as well that uh, we need models to actually do a good job at the 30 by 30 implementation. So overall, uh, what we're doing in our group is to use uh, AI models to predict uh, and estimate how biodiversity has evolved in deep time. Uh, and we hope to be able to use AI also to predict the, the future of biodiversity and hopefully help bending the curve of biodiversity loss. With this, I would like to thank uh, my lab for contributing different parts of the uh, projects that I've talked to you uh, about today. I would like to thank the SIP for organizing this symposium, uh, Patricia in particular, and you all for listening. Thanks.